Hi there, my name is Victoria Bowler and today we are looking at classroom management in elementary general music. Specifically, we are talking about all of the things that come before behavioral reward systems. Classroom management is one of the most impactful components of our jobs as elementary general music teachers. It's something that can really make or break our teaching just in terms of how much we enjoy our day-to-day -day experience in the classroom. Because ideally, at the end of the day, at the end of a workday, we will feel like we have worked really, really hard and we are energized from that work, as opposed to thinking that we have worked really, really hard and we are drained from that work. And for so many of us, this distinction comes down to how we treat each other in the classroom or classroom management. Classroom management is also a really personal subject because our approach to classroom management depends a lot on our own demeanor, our own personality as teachers, and the work environment and the school norms of the place where we teach. Today, we are not going to focus on these drag and drop behavioral reward systems like sticker charts, even though I know that those are really popular tools to use. Instead, let's back up and think about the practices and demeanors and habits that can make whatever tool we choose to use a little bit more successful. So if we were to step away from things like sticker charts and pizza parties, and even from things like star musician awards and using student choice as a reward for good behavior, are there any other foundational principles that we would do well to keep in mind? That's what we'll talk about today. Let's set the backdrop for this conversation. These are kind of the prerequisites for a healthy classroom management conversation, in my opinion. First, let's assume that you like your students and importantly, that they like you. Because very simply put, we all show more self-management when we actually like the person we are behaving for. And this makes sense to us as teachers, right? If we think about our relationship with our administration, it is easier for us to make decisions that we know are going to make our administration's life easier if we happen to like them as people. And the same is true for our students. Our students are just going to have an easier time making responsible classroom decisions if they happen to like us. The reality of classroom management is that students are going to push our boundaries in the classroom, right? And students are also going to mess up. That's inevitable. The other flip side of that is that we are also going to push our students' boundaries that they are trying to form. And students are very likely going to see us make some mistakes in our approach to conflict management in the classroom. So our interactions will just be much better if both parties can extend grace as we work through these boundaries of classroom management. And we're more likely to extend grace if we happen to like each other as people. Classroom management can also be a pretty emotional topic because we are dealing with very young children with very big emotions and we're working to help them manage their behavioral response to their emotions. The reality is that when we are doing this, sometimes we're gonna be working on these skills when students are in a really heightened emotional state, like really um, excited or really angry. And depending on what's happening in the classroom at the time, we might be in a pretty heightened emotional state as well. So being able to zoom back in on the humanity and the intrinsic value of the people we're working with, that can be really helpful. So let's start this conversation just by making sure we like our students and they like us. Next, let's assume that we are in the habit of communicating with students in a way that is respectful and in a way that models how we want them to talk to us and each other. So if we would not consider it appropriate for students to raise their voices and yell at each other or yell at us, then we will model the tone of voice that we want them to use when they're upset. If we don't think that students should um, snap back at us or use sarcasm in a way that's really biting and personal, then we are going to model how to communicate effectively when we have conflict in the classroom. The idea here is that our words and our demeanor are uplifting, even as we redirect behavior. Now, of course, like we already talked about, there are going to be times that we mess up in front of students as we are dealing with classroom management. But in general, as far as like a, um, a habitual patterned response, we're going to model the tone and the language that we would expect from students. 
Let's talk about some expectations for classroom management. When we know what to expect from students, we're a lot more likely to be prepared for classroom management issues when we come up. And we can also be better informed as we make those thousands of tiny minute decisions throughout the day as we redirect behavior. There are several questions that would be helpful for us to answer when we have this conversation about classroom management in terms of setting expectations. So how long is it reasonable to expect students to sit still? How long is it reasonable to expect students to stay focused on a single task? How long is it reasonable to expect students to be silent instead of talking? And then as a follow-up question, developmentally, what is the role of conversation and social interaction to that student? So when we ask a student to sit still and listen and be quiet, we know that there's a reason for that direction, but it's, uh, you know, it's so that they can listen to directions and be successful with the task that we're doing. But since we can see that this student is drawn toward talking and social interaction, is there a developmental purpose that those behaviors are serving that maybe we have not yet considered? And then the very last question is, what is a reasonable level of impulse control to expect from students? With all of these expectations, we'll also be thinking about how we might answer the question for a six-year-old versus an 11-year-old, right? Because our expectations are going to change as students are in different developmental stages throughout the different grade levels. One thing to point out here that I don't want to gloss over, I wanna make sure I've said, just because a behavior is developmentally appropriate does not mean it is always situationally appropriate. As the teacher, we are still trying to guide students to situationally appropriate behavior. So we can expect that it's developmentally appropriate for students to push boundaries. And pushing boundaries looks like something like um, talking or running to line up, right? Or losing focus or needing to move around. We would expect a six-year-old to have a relatively low level of impulse control. But that doesn't necessarily mean, that doesn't mean that we are going to sit back and watch them just run around the room and tear all of the instruments off of the shelves because we've decided it's developmentally appropriate. But having our expectations set on the front end in terms of what behaviors we can anticipate, that can help us make some of these nuanced behavioral redirection, all of those decisions that we make throughout the day. So once we notice that a student needs redirection, one of the best things that we can do is redirect to an action and not an inaction. Here's what I mean by that. Let's imagine that students are seated and someone is tearing up the corner of their sit spot. Instead of saying, Brittany, stop touching the sit spot, you might say, Brittany, we're all patting the steady beat right now. Or if it's time to line up and you see that someone has uh, sprinted to be in the front of the line, instead of saying, hey, no running in the classroom, we want to give them an action instead. Like, uh, this time try again while you step the steady beat to the song that we're all singing. Or this time try again while you tiptoe and step the rhythm of the song that we're all singing. What is the behavior that we want students to do instead of the behavior that you don't want to see? Because even in our mind, directions like sit down and focus, those seem really clear to us, right? Uh, but it's actually not concrete enough for our students in order for them to take the action that we actually want to see. Classroom transitions come into play here as well, and that's a topic that probably deserves its own video. So we won't go into it here, but I do want to mention it just as it relates to classroom management. Anytime students are moving between activities, that is like the danger zone. We want to be as specific as possible with the action that we want to see them take, not just the passive avoidance of the action that we don't want to see. You've probably heard that the best classroom management strategy is a good lesson plan, right? For our lessons to be successful from a classroom management perspective, my opinion is that we need a developmentally and a culturally appropriate combination of movement and choice and social interaction. When we do this, when we lesson plan in this way, we can partner with students to see what they're naturally motivated to do. And we can look for ways to align our classroom goals with their motivations. 
So if it's developmentally appropriate for students to talk and socialize, and we know that it is, then the best classroom management strategy for our lessons might not be to create lessons where students shouldn't talk, right? Instead, we can have moments where students should be silent, but then we can partner those moments with plenty of opportunities for group work and social interaction, where students need to talk and socialize in order to do the activity. This can be especially helpful for older students who talk a lot, right? They verbalize everything. With younger students in particular, we know that it's developmentally appropriate for them to need to move. Young students, young musicians are in a constant state of motion. So instead of planning lessons where students are asked to sit still for long periods of time, let's rethink that. Let's plan ahead to use as much movement as we possibly can. So we'll move around and then we'll sit down and then we'll get up and move around again and then we'll sit down again, right? And even in these high concentration portions of the lesson, we can still use a lot of movement that actually helps students focus. That's where we'll pause for today. We talked about how helpful it is for us to like our students and for them to like us. We talked about some patterns of communication and making sure that we are respectful as we redirect behavior. We talked about having developmentally appropriate expectations and the distinction, the important distinction between developmentally appropriate and situationally appropriate behavior. We also talked about the importance of redirecting to an action and not an inaction and how our lesson plans can partner with students' natural motivations. In the next video, we will look at some different levels of redirection that we can use to prevent a lot of classroom management issues from happening in the first place. And then I'll also share some resources that I've used to frame my thinking on this topic in case you are interested in um, reading more about classroom management. Like I said at the top of the video, classroom management is a really personal subject. Every teacher has a unique approach, right? But hopefully these principles are things that we can apply regardless of whatever behavior management tool we choose to use. All right, if you have a comment on this video, I would love to hear from you. You can drop it below. You can shoot me an email, victoria at victoriabowler.com, or you can find me on Instagram. I am at victoriabowler. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.